So just so everyone's aware, we only record the main part of the talk so you can be feel uh, uninhibited during the Q&A. Um, and do feel free to leave um, cameras on if you wish. Um, if you could just remain on mute when you're not speaking, that would be great so we don't get interference. So welcome to today's Consciousness Club, the first one of 2024. Um, great to see so many people here today. Um, and it's really um, my pleasure, our pleasure to um, be hosting Ramona Weil today. So Ramona is a professor of neurology at UCL at the Dementia Research Centre and honorary consultant neurologist at the National Hospital for Neurology. So Ramona leads a both a research lab, a welcome funded um, longitudinal study investing, investigating dementia and hallucinations in Parkinson's disease using brain imaging and plasma markers. So she'll be telling us a lot about that today. And she also manages a clinical service for patients with Parkinson's dementia and Lewy body dementia. So just a brief bio. So Ramona graduated from Downing College, Cambridge, studied medicine at UCL, completed a PhD at the Furl in Queen Square, which is where I met Ramona and where we started collaborating on work on metacognition, which is a whole different story. Um, mm. But I've um uh had the pleasure of knowing Ramona since then and seeing her career um and research flourish since then um so Ramona then trained as a clinical neurologist at the Royal Free and National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in Queen Square she was then awarded an UCL Excellence Fellowship uh followed by a welcome clinical um career development fellowship to start her research uh, her, her lab on uh, Parkinson's disease, and now she holds a very prestigious Welcome Career Development Award that aims to understand the basis for how dementia happens in Parkinson's disease. So we're delighted that you can join us for today's Consciousness Club. Ramona, I think it's an unusual perspective you bring to the world of consciousness science because it's um, coming from this clinical angle, but also has these you know, fascinating phenomena of hallucinations in Parkinson's. So thanks for giving the talk today. And the floor is floor is all yours. Brilliant. Thank you. And the, what brilliant people. I mean, I, I'm excited to see you, Mike Trimble. And um, so I think and 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 actually the, the variety of people who are here, I think it's it's I'm very interested to hear people's kind of responses and thoughts about what I'm presenting, because it's it's a kind of clinical angle on visual hallucinations. So I'm going to share um, this a bit. Even though we do this millions of times, it always takes a minute. So, right, Steve, can you see the slides? Yes, all good. Excellent. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about sort of visual hallucinations and really the, the kind of overarching frame that I want to, to, to ask about is why do they particularly happen in Parkinson's disease? They happen in other neurological conditions, but not as commonly. So that is the kind of overall frame. And um, this beautiful picture that's on the front um, was made by Angelica Zarkali, who I'm gonna share quite a lot of her work. Um, and she's a postdoc in my lab. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open actually. So as Steve said, I'm a neurologist. So I'm gonna open with three cases and then dive a bit more deeper into Parkinson's disease, kind of just give a bit of a framework in case people are a bit unfamiliar and then show some of the work that we've been doing, um, specifically looking at how uh, at hallucinations in Parkinson's disease, um, and then bring, wrap it all up. So the first case, um, some of you may know this case. So a 72 year old woman, and she developed some vomiting and double vision. And then she, a, a few months later, she then developed some facial weakness, well, some tongue deviation, some, some further eye sort of cranial nerve palsies and weakness and in, in coordination of her right hand. Um, Soon after that, she started to develop visual hallucinations at dusk and described seeing cats and chickens walking on the floor. And when she reached out and tried to touch them, they disappeared. And she also talked about people in, in bizarre costumes. Now, I don't have any imaging from this particular patient. You'll see in a minute why, um, or any more about quite what she saw. But people who had hallucinations due to the same cause have painted and made collages of the hallucinations that they see. And... Um, and actually what's striking, one of them has got some people in, but the others are quite um, basic, actually, sort of sort of forms and colours. So this case um, was described in 1922 by Jacques-Jean Lamy. This is the actual case that he described. And um, he called this pedun peduncular hallucinosis, um, peduncular because he thought that it was because she had a stroke in the midbrain. I 
don't know whether that was definitively known or shown. Obviously, there wasn't imaging at the time. And his theory was that this was a, he thought that the midbrain was the kind of seat of where dreams and sleep happened. So he thought that hallucinosis in, uh, that, that she was suffering from was due to a pathological release of, of these subcortical regions. There were a number of uh, cases, and actually some discussed with him, with Georges de Morsier, who we're going to meet a bit later, or we'll talk about a bit later. And what they noticed was that quite often people who had these hallucinations either had poor vision or somehow they had their eyes closed during them. So that's case number one. Second case is older, 89-year-old man. He was a magistrate, and he didn't have any cognitive symptoms at all, but he had quite severe cataracts. And he described over a period of several months seeing men, women, birds and buildings. And he, he said that they were quite distorted in their shape and size. So this is the original case that was written up in French. I haven't read the French by uh, Charles Bonnet. Um, and it was his actual grandfather. And since then, um, other cases have been, well, this is now a syndrome. And it's patients who have usually very severe visual loss um, who then describe hallucinations. And actually, the more common hallucinations that are described in Charles Bonnet syndrome are not usually like the original case. And I would, that's why I think it's quite interesting to go back to that original case. Quite often, Charles Bonnet syndrome um, hallucinations are, again, much more simple. They're sort of for, uh, forms or, or lights or blobs of colour, but not necessarily people. Um, so I have some questions about his original case uh, from seven, the 1700s. The third case is actually someone that I saw recently in clinic. Um, so he is a 74 year old man and he's had Parkinson's for five years. And um, but more recently, he just started to, to be very, very troubled seeing men in green overalls. And he gave me an absolutely clear description of quite a lot of men um, in, in his garden that he believed were digging up his garden. And he thought that they were bringing in excavators and digging trenches. And that was, those were his words. And he was so upset about the hallucinations that he was seeing was that, that he kept on calling the council. Um, and his wife was so embarrassed about this because there was nothing at all. No one was digging, of course, in his garden. Um, he, uh, so I treated him with a cholinesterase inhibitor, uh, denepazil, which boosts acetylcholine in the brain. And actually he did really well. So he, he carried on seeing some people, but he stopped worrying about them digging in the garden and he was no longer distressed by them and stopped phoning the council. So um, Parkinson's disease, just sort of thinking a bit more about it. So this is the midbrain on the left of a patient of a control and on the right of a patient who had died of Parkinson's. And the pathological characteristic of Parkinson's is that you get dying death, really, of dopaminergic ne neurons in the midbrain. So on the left, the control has, you can see the black of the substantia nigra, and in, in the white rectangle on the right, there's loss of that blackness. But Parkinson's, and I, I look up, this is my weekly clinic, I look, look after patients with Parkinson's all the time. It is not just, a, it doesn't just cause loss of dopaminergic neurons, and it doesn't just affect the midbrain. And actually, um, the, when people die with Parkinson's, actually, you, and you examine the brain, there are, there's the Lewy-related pathology really usually throughout the brain, particularly affecting um, quite often, quite diffusely in the cortex by the time they die. So I think just I really wanted to highlight that people, often Parkinson's people think about, well, it's midbrain, basal ganglia, motor disorder affect, you know, affects dopamine. And actually it isn't, it's not, it's much more, it's a multi-system disorder, it affects dopamine, but also um, acetylcholine, um, we're going to see serotonin is important, neuroadrenergic receptors um, and sort of pathways are also affected. So it's, it's, and actually when I talk to patients, I say, well, it's a multi-system condition. And actually I end up treating all sorts of, you know, bladder symptoms, depression. So it's much, much wider than a condition that just affects movement. And then I just wanted to give a framework of Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies and how that all fits together, because I'm going to be talking about dementia with Lewy bodies quite a lot. So if you have Parkinson's disease and we follow people up over long enough time, different cohorts have got different proportions, but up to 80% of patients will develop dementia. And then they have these four other core symptoms, not always four of them, but they will have up to four of them. So obviously Parkinsonism because they've got Parkinson's disease, but they'll also develop visual hallucinations, um, cognitive fluctuations where they can be really clear sometimes and then much more drowsy and sleepy at other times and REM sleep behavior disorder where they act out or move move around um, when, while they're sleeping or shout when they're sleeping. Often the REM sleep behavior disorder predates actually um, the Parkinson's by many years. Dementia with Lewy bodies is where they have this syndrome, they have a dementia and, and at least two out of those four core clinical features. But the key difference is that they develop their dementia either before they did get Parkinson's motor symptoms 
all within one year of the onset. So if you get Parkinson's and then six months later you get a dementia, then that's dementia with liver bodies. And we know, so currently there's a one year rule. So if it's more than one year, then it's Parkinson's disease dementia. And if they get the dementia at a year or less, it's dementia with liver bodies, which everybody agrees is really arbitrary and needs to change. Um, and if you look at the brains of people who've died of either Parkinson's dementia or dementia with liver bodies, our pathologists tell, tell us that they look the same. You actually can't tell them apart. Um, so they get these lumen related pathological accumulations. They get other pathologies. Well, actually, very often they have uh, beta amyloid and tau. Um, but there is also an umbrella term, Lewy body dementia. So, and I didn't make it up. It's different from dementia with Lewy body. So Lewy body dementia encompasses Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. And it's useful to have an umbrella term for two reasons. One is it's one reason it's useful is because they're so sim similar. So patients have the, the same, essentially the same core symptoms. And um, for things, I have a, run a support group for patients with Lewy body dementia, and some of them have got Parkinson's dementia, some of them have got dementia with Lewy bodies, but it's the same issues that they're all dealing with. And the other reason it's useful is you can't always tell, was it a year, was it a year and a half? Sometimes I see people three years after the dementia and they can't quite remember when it all started. Um, and also because it's a little bit arbitrary. So it's quite useful to have this umbrella term. So I'll be using the term Lewy body dementia sort of a bit interchangeably um, and quite and also Parkinson's dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies but that's how they kind of all fit in the framework so visual hallucinations where, how does that fit in Parkinson's dementia and Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies so they're really common so 40 but around 40 percent of people with Parkinson's will develop visual hallucinations at some point in their disease um, they're more common in dementia with Lewy bodies because partly because they're actually a defining a sort of a diagnostic criteria so if you get hallucinations and you've got dementia you can you're on the way to making a diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies so up to 70 percent of dementia with Lewy bodies actually possibly more if you have parkinson's and you develop visual hallucinations it's quite a bad sign in terms of your outcomes so it's actually the strongest predictor that that particular patient will need to be placed in a nursing home um, and it's a predictor for development of dementia as well um, and they're also really challenging to treat so and we'll, we'll think briefly at the end about sort of neurotransmitters, but the drugs that are used to, to treat Parkinson's disease, so particularly dopaminergic drugs like Cinemet, they can worsen or trigger hallucinations. And when we need to treat hallucinations, uh, we've got psychiatrists here, so antipsychotics that we sometimes, when hallucinations become distressing, um, the antipsychotics are linked with high mortality in, in general, but particularly high mortality in Parkinson's and dementia with Lewy bodies. So it's really challenging as well. It's challenging as a symptom, but it's also challenging to treat. Um, I've told you the story of a, a man in my clinic, but actually I'd really like you to hear the voice of a person describing their hallucinations. So I'm going to show you a film that I made with um, Simon Ball, who's a professional animator, and together with people with Lewy body dementia. So I introduced him to people from our support group and he met with them and he recorded them speaking. So in this clip, you're going to hear the voice of a person who has Lewy body dementia talk, describing her hallucinations and also the voice of, of her daughter. And when we made this film, it's a longer film and, and it's free to download. It's called Another Pre Another Presence and you can get it from YouTube. Um, we did, we actually had a sort of extended period where we got a lot of feedback from people with Lewy body dementia and their families. So there was a lot of input into, you know, that actually his his depictions were, they felt were quite sort of true to their experiences. So this is a two minute clip of a, this woman describing her hallucinations and she's describing children who she thinks live in her home. Can I talk about my family, my pretend family? Little children live with me, pretend little children. They didn't talk. I used to say, look, we could have such fun together. Why don't you talk to me? And I'd ask questions like, well, what do they wear? And then she said, that's a good question because I don't really know what they wear. And I'd find food around the house. And I treated them like proper children. And I gave them each a little biscuit at milk time. I mean, they really were there. I gave them pen and pencils. 
see if they could write or scribble or anything. But they were still exactly as I left it when I came back. I think we often forget the nature of the person, but what we're actually seeing is an amazing woman trying to care with all the love and attention on these children. This family meant a lot to me. I believed it wholeheartedly. So, I mean, her description of hallucinations, so some of those elements are, are absolutely classic. So I've just, um, yeah, so nearly always visual, nearly always biological, so people and animals, and then um, very vivid. So she she can really see them, they feel very real, although actually when her daughter asks her or what they wear, and she can't quite describe them, um, they often happen at the same time of day and often at a particular place in the home. So that's why I call this ghost in the bedroom. It's often, often in the bedroom, not always. Um, and... This lady, I mean, she 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 keeps saying, I believed it wholeheartedly. She puts out food for them. She's almost surprised that they don't play with the pencils and paper. Um, so she, yeah, so it's it's sort of amazing how how real they they really do seem to her. Um, they can be transient as well. Actually, for her, she has that they're very stereotyped and they keep coming back. Um, then but often they're in the in the moment they're very transient. And her lack of insight, so she is 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 on in a way sort of one end of an extreme. Quite often, people will know that what they, they, they what they're seeing are hallucinations, um, but in the moment they feel very real. Um, sometimes, but, but quite often, people can have hallucinations in the peripheries, and, and they're called passage hallucinations because, and as we've seen already, the French um, were were very early in describing hallucinations. And there can also be a sort of sense of a presence. And I've actually got a patient on the ward. I'm going to see this afternoon who's been describing a, a sense of a presence as well as having hallucinations. Um, and I, yeah, as disease progresses, insight can be lost, and that 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 can be when it can be challenging. Although actually, in some ways, this lady would seem quite comforted by her hallucinations, so I wouldn't necessarily treat those. But when they're um, upsetting or distressful, that's when um, when we think about treatment. So just kind of framing this question. So hallucinations, I've shown you that they're. they're there are lots of they, they do occur in other neurological conditions. So visual loss and stroke and migraine and epilepsy, those are really common neurological conditions, and you can get hallucinations with them. But actually, hallucinations in the context of those conditions are extremely rare. So really very small proportions. But Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy bodies, which are very common conditions as well, hallucinations are really common. So up to 40% in Parkinson's, 70% in dementia with Lewy bodies. So that's the question I want to frame. Um, why is it? Why are they so common, in, in particularly in Parkinson's? Um, and I'm going to leave that there and we'll come back to that at the end. So now I'm just going to take you through um, some work that we've been doing, looking at hallucinations in people who have Parkinson's. And um, really sort of four areas. So looking at incoming visual information, so bottom-up information, visual priors, sort of top-down. Um, really a, some a, some work that we've been doing on, on the kind of central role of the thalamus. And then neurotransmitters is not really work that I'm currently doing, although we've got some plans to do it. But I just really want to highlight it because I think um, you can't get away from, from this, this, from the, the importance of, of neurotransmitters in, in hallucinations. So um, visual changes in Parkinson's, so that's like a big focus of the work that we've been doing. But actually what I found when I started looking into it is, is that there's been quite a lot of work um, really from around the world, showing that um, visual changes in Parkinson's are quite common. And also where visual changes are present in Parkinson's, it's linked with quite bad outcomes, particularly with dementia. So Julius Anang is working in Canada, in Montreal, and he got people to uh, arrange these coloured um, sort of squares. And he found that people with Parkinson's who couldn't put them in the correct order when he followed them up developed dementia. There's some really nice work from Caroline Williams Gray in Cambridge, who took patients um, newly diagnosed, uh, really straight from the GP, diagnosed with Parkinson's and put them through a whole battery of different tests. And one of these was to, to ask them to copy intersecting pentagons. And she's now followed them up um, now more than 10 years. And what she found was that those patients at 10 years who at the baseline, when they could, when they struggled to copy intersecting pentagons, those patients were at double the risk of having dementia at their 10 year follow up. Um, 
uh, Nico Bonin's working in Michigan, and he's been doing um, a lot of work with co cholinergic transmission. But actually, this work is this I'm showing you is actually some FDG PET imaging. And he took patients with Parkinson's, did FDG PET imaging, and found that those patients who had Parkinson's and had occipital hypometabolism at six years, they were much more likely to have Parkinson's disease dementia. And then another sort of pathology group in the States looked at over 200 patients who had died, this sort of sort of post-mortem data, patients who died with Parkinson's dementia. And if you, this is survival data um, leading up to, to their death. And the red dotted line, that's the line of patients who had Lewy related pathology in occipital regions. And they had a much more steep and rapid de decline to dementia from Parkinson's. So all of this had, had actually been happening. But I got interested in this um, because of a clinical observation, which was that um, patients with Parkinson's told a colleague of mine, told Hugh Morris, that they had trouble reading capture images. Um, now, when we do capture images, it's all traffic lights and, and um, cars and things. But it used to be these funny letters and numbers. And he mentioned it to me. And my background, so when I was doing my PhD with, with at the same time as Steve, I actually was, didn't do anything to do with Parkinson's. I was doing visual neuroscience. And I just got thinking, well, why would it be that people who have Parkinson's disease, basal ganglia, motor disorder, why are they struggling with a visual task? So I decided to test it. And but i had been taught well. So if you want to test the visual things, letters and numbers are very confounded. So I took, um, instead of testing that, I, I, we set up a, a paradigm where we looked at pictures of cats and dogs. And um, because there's, you've got less of those kind of edges and curves as a confound, but actually the visual task of separating out a cat or a dog you, is, is, a, is a more complex task, is a complex task that we're all able to do. Uh, and then what we did was I, I distorted them by varying amounts. And by distorting them, then we could tell just exactly where the threshold was. We did it sort of psychophysically, where the threshold was, where they could only just tell if they were seeing a cat or a dog. So there were quite a lot of trials, so 400 trials. It took about um, 20 minutes. And I invited 20 people with Parkinson's who didn't have dementia and 11 controls, and they came um, to they came along to, to UCL. And I found that overall, the threshold for where they could just about tell if it was cat or dog um, was lower overall in people with Parkinson's. But I, I thought that this spread was really interesting and actually some of the patients were, were better than controls, but I wondered what would happen if we followed up the people who were bad at it over time. So I, I brought them back a year later um, and this time I'm showing you as a, as a D prime, but it's essentially the same task. And on the Y axis is the, their performance on the, they all called it cats and dogs test. So the performance on the cats and dogs test and on the Y axis is, is their performance in a cognitive task, which is something called the MOCA, which is a Montreal cognitive assessment. And I found that indeed the people who were worse at baseline at the cats and dogs test also showed a decline in their MOCA after a year. So it seemed like it was quite interesting, but these were quite small numbers. Um, so we kind of expanded the, the project and set up something we called it the vision in Parkinson's study. And, um, and we did a lot more testing. So we invited 100 people with Parkinson's and 40 controls. And we did a bunch of different vision tests. We did the cats and dogs, but we also did some biological motion as well, because I thought, well, it, it could be other higher order vision as well. So we wanted to come to look at other things. We did more basic things like Snellen um, acuity and also contrast sensitivity to get more basic visual uh, tasks. Uh, we did some retinal imaging, very detailed neuropsychology, about just it's a bit more than an hour. Uh, we've collected blood for plasma and genetics, and that's ongoing. We've just got some fresh data with that, actually, and uh, some imaging. And um, we brought them in at baseline and then two further visits, 18 months apart. So um, we've just published, actually, our visit three data, and I'm going to show you some of that. And what we found um, tied up with, with these other groups uh, internationally. So patients with Parkinson's who were worse at the vision tests, and we did a kind of combination of the cats and dogs and the biological motion. So if they were worse at both of those, they were more likely to have developed mild cognitive impairment, MCI, at their 18 month visit. And they were also more likely to have dropped their um, mini mental state examination score. But we've now just got our three year data and actually with um, on sort of survival analysis, what we've what we've now done is looking at well all cause survival. So developing dementia, being too frail to attend for follow up. And that was done by someone who were blinded to their performance. But if they couldn't come because they were frail or if they died and we combined that as a kind of all cause survival. And in blue were people who were good or sort of average or good at the visual test and in, in peach are the people who were bad at the vision test. And um, it really predicted that by three years, if you were bad at the vision test, you were sort of about 60% um, likely to have one of these poor, poor or cause survival, sort of to died, be too frail to, to come or have developed dementia. 
um, compared to the people who were good at the visual test. So um, that's patients with Parkinson's, but who know like having poor poor vision and having poor outcomes. But what about hallucinations? So we have we have looked a little bit at hallucinations, but Annette Schreck has actually um, so she's a neurologist uh, based at UCL, and she specifically looked at patients with Parkinson's who hallucinated compared to those who didn't hallucinate, and she worked together with Finn Bremner, who's a, a neuro ophthalmologist, and compared lower level visual acuity and then also higher order tasks and showed that patients with Parkinson's who were worse at the higher order vision, sorry, who were hallucinated were also worse at the higher, higher order visual tasks. So higher order visual dysfunction is seen in, in those patients. So that's kind of incoming visual information. What about priors? Because we know that vision is, it's an interplay. So we, it's, we have what information from the eyes, but also what we're expecting to see. And those are our priors. So, and that could be made up of memories or our previous knowledge. So what we actually see is a combination of both of those. And um, shown you already that information coming from the eye and, and sort of visual processing inf inf information is, is degraded in people, with, in a, not everybody, but in, in a proportion of patients with Parkinson's. So the question we wanted to know um, was, what about top-down influences? Are those affected in patients who have Parkinson's disease who hallucinate? So this is work that um, Angelica Zarkali um, has done. She was did it as, as a very first um PhD experiment uh, and uh, did this in collaboration with Rick Adams. And um, she took these pictures, the sort of black and white pictures, um, sort of Mooney images that, that when you've, if you when you've seen them for the first time, they just look like black and white blobs, but they're generated from a colored template. So, um, sorry, my thing's gone in the wrong place. Anyway, well, it will sort itself out. So she, um, what she did was that she asked people, do you see an, an object in, in this image? And if you've never seen it before, it just looks like black and white. Uh, do, sorry, not you see an object, you see a person. So if, you, if you've never seen it before, it just looks like blobs. But once you've seen the underlying image, which is a, and I know Steve has seen this one, so you knew that there's a very cute baby in a bucket. But if you haven't seen it before, it, it just looks like blobs. But once you've seen it, you, you know straight away, you can see that baby in the bucket. So that was a way of kind of manipulating the visual priors. So she invited people with Parkinson's who hallucinated or um, and also who didn't hallucinate to come to UCL. And she showed them images who, that really did have people in them and also images that didn't have people. And then she showed them the underlying template and then she showed them the, um, the, the, the black and white image again. And what she wanted to know was whether how the improve, everyone's going to improve, but how much people improved after seeing their colored template. And what she found was that Everybody did improve, as we expected, but hallucinators improved even more. And actually to see an improvement in people with Parkinson's on their way to, to dementia, some of these patients, was quite exciting, actually, to see that you see an, an even better, sort of not better performance, but a greater improvement in, in this particular patient group. Um, she then looked at the relationship between test performance and hallucination severity using a hallucination scale called a it's called a University of Miami um, hallucination scale that we that we use quite a lot. And she found that patients who um, had worse hallucination severity also showed even greater improvement. So they seem to utilize their visual priors more than patients who don't hallucinate. So there's there's also there's been quite a lot of interest in um, sort of shifts in attentional networks and um, and some really nice work that um, different groups have done. So Max Shine working in Sydney now nearly ten years he's, he's doing all sorts of incredible stuff now. But around ten years ago, um, pre presented a model looking at over reliance of endogenous networks. And Ramton Miriam's working was is, was or is working in Newcastle and um, showed using EEG that there's weaker connectivity in visual networks. But until recently, most of this work has been correlational. And if you want to look at kind of causal inferences, sort of especially looking at top down, is there too much top down influence? Um, you can't use the sort of correlation type setup. You need to use a different approach. So this is work that um, that my then PhD student and now um, now postdoc George Thomas did, collaborating with Peter Zeidman and Adil Razi. And he used dynamic causal modeling to test so we can look at the direction of connectivity change. So the direction of, of um, sort of influence of one region against another. So he did this in 15 patients with Parkinson's um, who hallucinated and 75 who, who, who didn't. And he took, um, we chose regions that we expected to be relevant in Parkinson's hallucinations. So bilateral prefrontal cortex, bilateral hippocampus, um, medial thalamus and a V1 and also a bilateral lateral geniculate nucleus as well. So quite an, an emphasis on the thalamus, as we'll see. 
And um, he, uh, so we extracted the time series from each of these, and this is one individual. And then you can convert them to um, to the frequency domain. And this is because we're looking at resting state data. So that's uh, sort of more efficient. And what we can then do is specify a generative model of the frequency data, but then we're interested in inverting that to find the strength and, and the connection of strengths that best explains the, the, the data that we see for that particular individual. You could, what we, he, he then did was then model the hypothesis, the group differences um, in strengths and connections. And he did this using a parametric em empirical Bayes. And what you can do is we can display that on a grid. And, and the benefit of this is that you can see a connection from along the top. So we've got our six different regions along the top and then where they're going to along the side. And it's a heat map. So warm colors are increasing connection and cold colors are decreasing connection. Um, the diagonal are intrinsic connections. So we're, we're not as interested in, in those. What we're most interested in is the off diagonal. And straight away, I and mean, you can also see it as a ball and stick, but what will kind of jump out is, first of all, there's there are quite a few different regions that are, are, are affected. So it's actually probably more than one change in connection. Um, but what we found was the, the greatest connections were particularly reduced reduction in connectivity from LGM to V1, and then an increase from left prefrontal cortex, sort of top down to medial thalamus and V1. But interestingly, we got this lateralized effect that we still don't totally understand why, but we did find a lateralized effect with a decreased top down connection from prefrontal cortex to V1. So um, what he then did was he combined the change in connection from the top five um, regions and then related them to hallucination severity. He, he didn't just do it for the top five, though. He also has replicated this with the top 10 and even just with the top one, with a trend just for the top one, and showed that this pattern of differences in connectivity explains real world differences. So this hallucination severity is a, just a questionnaire. So it really ex showed, explained that this hallucination severity in our group. So it seems like it's the combination of it is incoming information. So deg degraded top down, but also perhaps overweighting of the priors. Um, in patient, patients who hallucinate. And we, we thought it was quite nice to be able to, to actually show this when we, we'd seen it behaviorally, but then to be able to show it using um, differences in, in, um, in, in sort of causal connectivity. So the thalamus, I mentioned Georges de Mausier, who he actually was Swiss, but he was working at the same time as um, Lermit in France. And together they, Lermit had, had thought the midbrain uh, might be important, but Georges de Mausier really played placed the thalamus as very central. He thought the thalamus was likely to be very important. And this is one of a very early diagram of, of his, um, likely to be very causal and important in visual hallucinations. Um, but of course, he he couldn't test that directly. Now, if, if we want to test um, the, the role of a particular brain region in a condition, classically what you might do is compare patients who have the condition that versus those who don't and look at differences in atrophy. And that's been done with quite a lot of studies, just comparing atrophy patterns and patients who with Parkinson's who hallucinate comparing those who don't. And actually the atrophy studies are really inconsistent and they don't show any clear region. And, and that's this conventional lesion approach is you have three patients who have the same condition and but different lesions. If you look at where the, over, the lesions overlap, that can give you what the anatomical substrate of that syndrome is. But what do we do in this case Parkinson's hallucinations when we've got three patients who've got lesions but actually here points of positions of atrophy and they don't overlap. So I um, a few years ago I, I traveled to Boston and I spent um, a summer working with Mike Fox and he's been using uh, an approach based on underlying functional networks and actually it's, it's quite nice because he was actually one going back to 2005 he was uh, together with Marcus Ra Rakel had done some of the original work on resting state functional MRI showing underlying functional connectivity and the importance that um, well using resting state functional MRI you can uncover positive correlations between particular brain regions and also anti-correlations negative um, correlations and really when we see that sort of correlation correlational activity with um, that we, we can consider those regions functionally connected. So he's been doing um, a, a great deal of work, taking advantage of the human connectome, um, really what he calls a, a, a detailed wiring diagram of functional connectivity, um, and relating it. So and so from this from the functional connectivity pattern, saying well, if regions are not related in, in anatomical space, perhaps they they relate more to an underlying functional connectivity map. 
So he's done a, a lot of work in all sorts of neurological symptoms. This is just one example of freezing of gait um, in Parkinson's, well, freezing of gait in Parkinson's with Alfonso Fasano. But he's done it for all sorts of neurological symptoms, so cervical dystonia and even um, hyper he's done psychiatric conditions like hyper-religiosity and um, delusional misidentification as well. And um, he, he'd also not just taken lesions, but also been looking at positions of atrophy from um, and, and shown that this also can, can be done using atrophy to look at to understand different types of dementia. So we took this approach, I took this approach with him, looking at um, Parkinson's hallucinations. And so what we did was we, we identified all the different studies that we could find where groups had compared Parkinson's patients who hallucinated with Parkinson's patients who didn't hallucinate. And we did it, I did a, a very large literature search. Actually, the, I only found nine studies in total that were, with, that did that head to head comparison. Um, and from those nine studies, I extracted the coordinates that were reported in the, in the papers um, of exactly where, where, they, where they found those differences. And what you can see, they're little red crosses, but they're they're not in any consistent location. They're, they're spread kind of across the brain as the atrophy studies have, have reported. Um, and you can show them on a glass brain. And what Mike then does is he then identifies the network of brain regions that are connected to, sort of functionally connected to each atrophy point. So what, you, what we then could do was that for each study, we could identify a study functional network map that related to the coordinates identified by that study. So each study has a very different appearing uh, functional network map, but quite consistently across the studies, we found that um, the thalamus was, was part of that underlying connection. Um, and what we did was just looked at overlap and found the kind of point of, of overlap. And this is an overlap map, there's no masking or anything. And we found maximum overlap over the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And actually just to say, in parallel, I did also looked at Parkinson's um, dementia and mild cognitive impairment, and we found different locations. So it's not just that, oh, well, the thalamus does everything, so it's always gonna show up. Actually, for different symptoms, we found different um, centers uh, be being involved. But the other thing that was really, so we found 89% overlap across all the studies. I think it was just one of them didn't, um, I think it's study number 30, didn't show overlap over the, um, over the lateral geniculate nucleus. But at the same time, he had another visiting scholar, um, who is uh, visiting from South Korea, Nayang Kim. And she was working on patients who had hallucinations due to lesions. So they didn't have Parkinson's disease. They just had brain lesions of different causes. <clears throat> so they could be uh, tumors or strokes or whatever. And she um, identified all the different lesions that had caused different types of hallucinations. And I'm showing you data from the visual hallucinations. Um, and and she and it won't surprise you that these lesions were in different brain locations. But when she similarly identified the underlying functional um, networks associated with each of those lesions and then overlapped them, she also found overlap bilaterally over the lateral geniculate nucleus over the thalamus. So it was really elegant, actually, at the same time that we were doing these totally separate studies in patients who hallucinate from different causes. But when we looked at functional overlap, um, overlap of functional networks, we both identified that when a lesion or a coordinate of atrophy causes hallucinations, it seems to involve a, a, a network that's centered or involves the thalamus. So just for the final bit of, of this isn't really data, it's just to kind of mention neurotransmitters because I think they've got to be part of the picture. So any neurologist will tell you that if you have a patient with Parkinson's and they have hallucinations and you give them a dopamine agonist, their hallucinations will, will get worse, or you can even trigger hallucinations in people who don't um, already have them. Um, and Katerina Schmack has been doing absolutely outstanding, beautiful work in mice, showing the central importance of dopamine in hallucinations, and that um, it contributes to, to faulty perceptual inferences uh, and a sort of bias of, for, for prior expectations, even, even against sensory evidence. So perhaps kind of this overweighting of priors really being rooted in, in, in dopamine. Um, acetylcholine, I already mentioned to you that my uh, patient who'd been seeing men in green overalls in the garden when I treated him with a cholinesterase inhibitor, which what cholinesterase inhibitors do is they stop the breakdown of acetylcholine. So there's more of it around. So he his hallucinations improve. And um, actually the patient I'm seeing this afternoon, <laughs> I've already seen, he's on amitriptyline, which is a, an anticholinergic. So, and he's hallucinating. So one of the first things I want to do is to stop his amitriptyline. So hallucinations will worsen with anticholinergics. Um, I, I don't know the exact mechanism for this. I've 
I mean, I'd love to hear what people's thoughts are, but I've heard about improving sensory precision, possibly some involvement of um, thalamal reticulate nucleus. Um, but certainly, uh, as a gestalt, I know that if you if you treat people with anticholinergics, their hallucinations get worse, and 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 conversely, cholinesterase inhibitors often improve things. And a sort of the final neurotransmitter, to just to kind of touch on a serotonin. Um, and there had been a lot of interest in serotonin because one of the most effective anti antipsychotics is clozapine, which acts on serotonin receptors. Um, it has a, again, it's quite hand wavy. It has a role in early and complex sensory processing. I mean, there's people much more sort of knowledgeable about serotonin on this call than I am. Um, <clears throat> but serotonin has also become more relevant recently because there's a very large trial in the states. Um, actually, it's now ten years ago or pimavanserin, which is a 5-HT2A inverse agonist. So it's effectively a serotonin blocker. And that showed an improvement in patients, in, in nearly 200 patients with Parkinson's, an improvement in their hallucinations. Um, and interestingly, there was a sub-study of patients who had Parkinson's with some mild cognitive impairment. And those patients who had worse cognition actually did even better with pimavanserin. Um, it's very expensive and it's available in the States. It's not available in the UK. So yeah, so... Uh, hoping that I did include this. So we're, we're now doing a trial here in the UK on a different serotonergic agent on Dancitron. It's been around in the UK for, um, for, for more than 20 years as an anti-sickness drug. Um, and actually, some um, there was an open label trial in the 1990s in patients with Parkinson's who had hallucinations and also uh, delusions, just 16 people, um, but they nearly all showed improvement. So um, we're now doing a trial. We've called it Top Hat Trial of Ondansetrin um, as a Parkinson's hallucinations treatment, um, and it's we've we've already recruited over a hundred patients. We need to get to two hundred, so um, we'll we'll find out hopefully soon whether Ondansetrin also works to treat Parkinson's hallucinations. And actually, it's also the trial's been opened up for di dementia with Lewy bodies as well. So I've kind of showed you some some data from us and also other groups. Um, some relevant mechanisms for hallucinations in Parkinson's, that patients with Parkinson's do develop um, deficits in visual processing, particularly higher order visual processing. Um, and um, and those patients who do well are at, are at higher risk of developing hallucinations from Manetta Schrag's work. Visual priors, um, patients who hallucinate seem to rely or use their visual priors more. And actually it's it, our, um, George Thomas's really nice work showing that it, it's likely to be obviously a, a combination of both. It reduced uh, in, incoming information and then too much top down. Central role, very likely for the thalamus. And then neurotransmitters, so implicating dopamine, acetylcholine, and probably um, serotonin. So coming back to my original question, hallucinations being present but rare in these other common neurological conditions, but really common in Parkinson's disease. So, I mean, maybe it's just all about threshold. So it, each of these, and I, and there are other mechanisms I haven't mentioned, but, but and, and they are also probably um, present and relevant in Parkinson's. But maybe so visual, having visual dysfunctions, and certainly patients with cataracts are more likely to develop hallucinations, derangement of neurotransmitters, over-reliance on top-down priors, um, and dysfunction in thalamus and thalamic connections. So maybe we're just more likely to get all of these happening together in Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's dementia and in dementia with Lewy bodies. So that's just, it's just that confluence. So that we just, the threshold is lowered generally in those patients. And that's why we often see hallucinations in Parkinson's disease. But actually, if you get a com these combinations, for if you have a thalamic stroke, but you have cataracts as well, may maybe it's in those other, when you, if you get some of those other things in other conditions, then that's why you can see them. It's just less common to get all of all of these other factors together. So um, I'd love to know what people think, and definitely it's it's a very simplistic model, and it can certainly be modified and improved. Um, just want to thank, especially George Thomas and Angelica Zarkely, um, who are doing fantastic work, really, to sort of teasing apart hallucinations, and there's kind of new things coming through um, from them. And Simon Ball for the animation for, um, that that I showed you, and thanks so much for for listening, and looking forward to hearing what you think. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Ramona. So we should first...